I have shared with uh, you before, I grew up on a dairy farm, a Jersey dairy farm in Mount Angel, Oregon. And as a kid, I had many chores that I had to do on the farm. In fact, I was just recalling yesterday to someone, I first learned to drive a tractor when I was six. Uh, and, you know, farm labor is much cheaper when it's your own. Uh, but anyway, uh, one of my jobs, every night I would go out to the barn and I would have to feed our calves, the calves, the young, the young cows. I'd feed them milk and grain and hay and water. Uh, it wasn't really hard work and I didn't mind it. And, but the problem was that after feeding the calves, I have to say the calves always appreciated it, uh, after feeding them, that's when I began to get nervous. And I began to be filled with lots of anxiety. And the reason was not because I disliked farm work, but the reason was that after I was done, I had to make the walk from the barn to our farmhouse. Now that walk was probably no more than 100 feet or so, not a great distance, but the problem was that at night, especially during the winter in Oregon, it gets dark very, very early. And if you've ever been out in the countryside, you have to understand that there's a different form of darkness out there, isn't there? There's no street lights, there's no traffic, there's no house lights. It's really, really dark. You see, there's dark, and then there's country dark. And country dark is pitch black. All you've got is the moon and the stars, and when those aren't shining, it's really, really dark out there. And so I'd finish my chores, and I would brace myself, because I knew that walk was ahead of me. The other problem was, even though it was 100 feet, walking into that darkness on our farm, our buildings were the stuff of a child's nightmares. They were dark, they were shadowy, and any time the slightest wind would blow, they would creak and moan and groan. Now the logical part of my childlike brain would say, there's nothing to worry about. You live on a farm, it's rather isolated, you're out in the country, you'll be fine. But the imaginative side of my brain would say, there are monsters out here everywhere you look. Now what kind of monsters? Isn't it obvious? Angry, vengeful cows. I could just picture behind that old shed was a jealous jersey. Over there was a homicidal Holstein. Over there was a bad brown Swiss. It went on and on, and my mind would start to just pile on these images. And so what would I do? I would run as fast as I could, wearing my little rubber boots, run down that road and I would not stop until I got inside the house and closed that door. It was terrifying and I had to do that every single night over and over and over again. Now here's the thing though, some nights after finishing my chores I would stick around a little bit longer and I'd help my dad or my grandpa with the cows. And when I did that, if I stuck around to the end of milking until everything was cleaned up, then that walk wasn't so scary because I didn't have to make it on my own. My dad or my grandpa would make the walk with me. And it's amazing how that walk that terrified me literally caused me to tremble and sweat and sprint in my rubber boots. That walk was just fine when my dad or grandpa walked beside me. It wasn't scary at all. I share this with you because perhaps you've had a walk like that before. Have you ever been in a part of the neighborhood, a part of the city where you didn't quite feel safe? Maybe it was at night, maybe it was somewhere unknown, and as you're walking along, you're kind of nervous. Have you ever had that feeling? Maybe you're out in the woods somewhere where you just didn't feel quite safe. Now, I want you to imagine what would that walk be like if you had someone bigger and stronger walking beside you? Perhaps you even had a police officer walking next to you. Would it be quite as scary to be in that area? Probably not. If you knew that the person next to you could protect you, would you be quite as afraid? Probably not. You'd probably walk 
a little bit calmer, wouldn't you? Well, friends, that's exactly what we see today in Psalm 23. We see a walk. And where is this walk taking place? Go back to Psalm 23, go to verse 4, and I'm going to let you know we are only looking at one verse today. One verse, a whole sermon on one verse. You're like, wow, that should be five minutes. Ha <laughs> ha, you haven't been here long. All right, no, we're looking at verse 4, Psalm 23, verse 4, and this is the walk that we're talking about. So right now, let's read it together one more time. Let's read Psalm 23, verse 4 together. Even though I walk through the darkest valley... I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. That's our verse today. That's what we're talking about. We are looking at this verse, and we are talking about taking a walk. Taking a walk into the darkness, into the fear. So right now, I want you to turn to someone else. Make eye contact with someone else and say, hey, neighbor. I hope you brought your walking shoes and a good flashlight because we are walking. And we're walking into the dark valley. But neighbor, don't worry. Don't be afraid. You won't be walking alone. So let's take a look at Psalm 23, verse 4. And let's put that verse back up for a, a moment because I want you to take note of the very first two words of this verse. The very first two words that our psalmist writes. And most likely, most biblical scholars agree that the person who wrote this psalm, if you've got a, a study Bible, it probably says a psalm of who? David. And we know David is not just some David, that's King David. And David, if we know a little bit about his life, right, he's the one who killed Goliath, right? He's the one who became the second king of Israel. But what was David's job as a young man? What did he do? What was his occupation? He was a shepherd. So did David know a thing or two about taking care of sheep, yes or no? Yes, absolutely. He did it all the time. That was what he did. And so when David writes a psalm about God being our shepherd, you need to understand he knows all about sheep and he knows all about what it means to be a shepherd. But let's go ahead and look at those first two words. What are the first two words of verse 4? Even though. Even though. Why does David choose even though? Is it just sound good? Is it a stylistic choice? No. What is he saying? Even though means that if you are a follower of God, you will have to walk hard walks sometimes. You will have to walk through dark valleys sometimes, even though you have a mighty and great God, even though you obey and worship the God of heaven and earth, you will have to have hard walks in the valley sometimes, even though, even though, and if we think about the early church, the early followers of Jesus, did they ever face dark valleys in their life? Did they ever encounter persecution? Did they ever get thrown in jail? Were they ever killed? Yes, yes. The Bible tells us that by being a follower of Christ, we will face suffering. We will face persecution. We will have to walk through dark valleys. Even though we have a God who does all things, we, as his followers, will have to make hard walks. Even though. But let's talk about these walks. David says, where is the danger in the walk of the shepherd? Is it up on the high ridge line of the mountains? Is it in the sheep pen and the barn? No. Where's the danger? What part? It's in the darkest valley. Let's talk for a moment about valleys. 
Because valleys are dangerous. See, every year, a shepherd has to take his sheep from up in the top mountain range back to the barn, back to the sheep pen, back to wherever the sheep have their stronghold, you could say. And in order to get there, he has to go through the valley. Now, the valley can be lush. If you look at the rest of Psalm 23, the valley is quite beautiful. But the problem is, the valley is dangerous. There is danger in the valley. What are the dangers of the valley? Well, for a shepherd guiding a large flock of sheep, the dangers of the valley are predators, wolves, coyotes, lions, really, really angry rabid rabbits, whatever they might be, there are dangers in the valley. And the problem in the valley is there's not a lot of places to hide. There's not a lot of obstacles to get behind to protect you. You are exposed. The other problem in the valley is that when your valley is down here and there's a rock line above, what happens to rocks? Over time, they begin to fall. And when they fall and tumble, where do they go? Down in the valley. So you could be in danger, not just of an animal attack, but rocks or mudslides. The valley is dangerous. Put it this way, for those of you that have, have, it, have much military strategy, have you ever trained in the military or trained in just that strategy, is it better to have the high ground or the low ground? High ground, right? The high ground. You have a better vantage point. And that's the valley. The valley is dangerous. It is a place of danger. My question for you this morning is, what are the valleys in your life? What are your valleys? What are those walks of your life that are hard, that are scary? Not just my childhood of running from the barn to the house, but what valley are you walking in today? What valley have you walked in? What valleys are in your future? Perhaps you are in the valley of sickness and injury. Perhaps you are in the valley of trying to recover from something and the physical pain that you are experiencing. It's a hard valley to walk through, isn't it? Or maybe you're in the valley of grief or you're walking with someone who's in the final stages of life and it's hard. Or you're with someone who's just experienced a tremendous loss and it's hard. Those are valleys. Or maybe it is a valley where you are in financial trouble. You don't know how you're going to make it. Not just today, but tomorrow and the next week. You don't know how you're going to take care of it all. Is that the valley you're in? Or maybe it's a valley of loneliness where you just feel so isolated and all alone. Maybe those that you have loved have moved away, have passed away, and you just feel alone. What valley are you in today? What valley have you walked through? What valleys will you walk through in the coming days and weeks? What are your valleys. Let's go back to Psalm 23, 4 for a moment. I want you to look just again at the first part of that verse. What is the pace of the person in this psalm? Are they, are they running? Are they sprinting like me in my little rubber boots? No. What are they doing? They're walking. Even though I walk. Walk. Now, does it say they're quickly walking? They're nervously walking? They're power walking? Maybe they've got the spandex on and right doing this. No. They are just walking. They're just walking. It gives no indication that their walk is even fast. They are strolling. And so then the question we have to ask is, how is that possible? If they are in this dark valley, 
surrounded by danger, as David says, in the presence of my enemies, where there could be someone at any turn, someone just above, looking down, waiting to destroy me, how can they be walking? Shouldn't they be running? Shouldn't they be fleeing? Shouldn't they be at least doing a zigzag pattern? No. How can that be? Because there's more to the verse. Because this whole verse, it's less about the sheep, but who's this verse all about? What's this psalm all about? It's about the shepherd. The psalmist says, David says, I can walk because I'm not alone. I'm not alone. Just like my experience, that walk from the barn to the farmhouse was not so scary when my dad or my grandpa was with me. I was not alone. And that's exactly what David is telling us. He's saying, friends, you are able to walk because you are not alone. No, the shepherd is with you. The shepherd is there walking with you. The shepherd is by your side. That's how you are able to walk in the dangerous valley. That's how you are able to walk when the weight of the valley is pressing against you in the darkness and the sphere. You are able to walk because the shepherd is with you. And David lets us know an important fact about the shepherd. If you look at the end of the verse, it says, I will fear no evil for you, you, Lord, you are with me. And what does the shepherd in Psalm 23 have? He has two tools. He has what? His rod and his staff. Let's talk for a moment about the rod and the staff. Now, the rod and the staff. The shepherd's staff, that's what we all know, right? When you think shepherd, you usually think a shepherd holding a staff, right? It's got the long handle, and then it's got the curl on the top. And, you know, that's not stylistic. I've been around enough sheep to know that has a purpose. There's the reason that staff has got that crook is that's how you grab a sheep. You swing out and you grab it right by its neck and you pull it. But when we think of the staff, the staff is not a tool for punishment. The staff is there to do what? to guide, to correct, to steer. Literally, you put that staff around the sheep's neck and you pull them. Because sheep, as we heard in our kids' message, they will wander off. And when one sheep wanders, many will follow. And so the shepherd will see as they go down that mountain path, he sees the sheep heading off and he knows that's not safe. So he reaches the staff out, pulls the sheep back. It's not to hurt the sheep, it's to protect it. The staff is an important tool. And that's what we think. We think shepherd, we think staff, right? We think candy cane, right? That we've seen, we've seen enough Christmas pageants to know you can't be a shepherd without a staff. But the problem is we forget there's how many tools? Two. A shepherd doesn't just carry a staff. What else does a shepherd have? The rod. Now there's a picture up there of a staff and a rod. You'll notice the rod is quite a bit shorter, isn't it? The rod, we could also say, is more like a club. It's a club. In fact, it's a bit of a rite of passage, even today in parts of the world, where shepherding really hasn't changed a whole lot in hundreds of years, that a young shepherd will go and find a sapling. And he will find the perfect sapling, he'll cut it off, and then he will begin to whittle that sapling into his rod, into his club. And if you notice, the end of the rod is a little bit thicker, isn't it? The rod is usually just a couple feet. But the purpose of the rod is very different than the staff. If the staff is there to correct and to guide and to steer, what is the rod for? To protect, to punish, not the sheep. Most shepherds would probably never use their rod much on their sheep. 
Who's that rod for? Those that want to hurt the sheep. Those that want to harm the sheep. If a wolf, if a lion comes to attack the sheep, what are they going to get? The rod. The rod. And let me tell you, a shepherd with a rod is not someone you want to mess with. That rod can be lethal. In fact, in parts of the world, I was reading a book about shepherding. There's a great book about Psalm 23 written by a shepherd. And he talks about in parts of the world, especially in Africa, out in the bush, that young shepherds practice often with their rods. They're able to throw their rods with incredible accuracy. Sometimes as far as 50 to 100 yards. Just putting things, targets, and just nailing them with power and precision with this rod. And I was thinking, a shepherd boy throwing a rod 50 to 100 yards. I think maybe the Broncos should sign him up. But anyway, that rod is dangerous. You mess with the sheep, you're going to get the rod. Modern day shepherds also, they'll carry a staff, but they've upgraded the rod. Now their rod is called a rifle. And if a predator comes in, they're not going to get within 100 yards and that rod will fire. And what is the purpose of the rod? The purpose of the rod is to harm, to kill. You mess with the sheep, you get the rod. The shepherd has those tools, the staff to guide and the rod to defend to protect. Friends, don't miss this. We have a good shepherd who carries both. He carries the staff, but he also carries the rod. And if you mess with his sheep, you will receive the rod. Just ask Satan. He's had that rod a few times. The rod of God, and yes, I know that rhymes. The rod of God is powerful. He protects his sheep. He guides you with his staff. Yes, sometimes you don't want his guidance. Sometimes you don't like it. And he sometimes has to correct us with that staff. But understand, he also has that rod because he protects you. You are his sheep. He is our good shepherd. And so you say, yep, got it, Dave. I have heard that verse. I know that psalm. Perhaps I even got that memorized. I've been to so many Christian memorials. I've heard it. I've heard it. I've heard it. I've heard it in songs. I've heard it everywhere. I've got it probably somewhere in my house. There's a picture of a shepherd. You say, yep, I got it. But you're thinking to yourself, but you don't know. You don't know the dark valleys that I am walking through right now. You don't know what is going on in my life, what has happened. And if you did, you would know it is so hard to keep walking. And that's our question. Can I really keep walking? When I think about the darkest valley that I have been through, that I am in right now, can I really keep walking? walking. Is that possible? Yeah, I know about the Good Shepherd. I've heard about him since I was little. I get it. I see. I've seen the pictures. But can I really keep walking when it's this hard? When things are against me, when so much is out of control, when there's so much uncertainty, can I keep walking? Can I keep going on? And if you've ever asked that question, you don't have to take my word for it, that the answer is yes. You don't even have to take David's word for it, that the answer is yes, that you can keep walking. Let's take a look at someone who walked through the darkest of valleys. Someone who came face to face each day with danger, with threats and suffering. The beginning of the service, I said today, is known as the day of the Christian martyr. And we saw that quick little video there about a man named Abdweli who lived in Somalia. And we want to tell a little bit more about his story. And as you listen to his story, just a few minute video, 
This comes from Voice of, of the Martyrs. I want you to think, did he walk through that battle? Was he able to continue to walk? So let's go ahead and watch it now. Abdullahi Ahmed was a student attending an Islamic school when he came to a life-changing realization. The answer he was looking for wasn't Muhammad. It was Jesus. I was brought up to believe that Islam is in my blood, in my thinking, in my heart and everything. But in that way, God has a purpose and a plan for me. And despite pressure and persecution, he enrolled in a Bible college and immediately started preaching the gospel. I was persecuted. I was set away. Then I was beaten up. I was set away from home. All sort of bad things were done to me. My own life was in danger. Abdullahi got married, became a family man, and his ministry began to grow. And on February 7, 2013, he was gunned down by three assassins on a street in northern Kenya. People who didn't understand their commitment to the gospel were shocked at his wife Helen's response to the murder of her husband. We have a triumphant God, and we know he's going to triumph in this situation. Long before he was murdered, Abdullahi showed that he would pay any price for his obedience to Christ. Almost immediately following his conversion, he was beaten. At one point, a mob of 40 people came to his mother's house seeking to kill him. He escaped and later said, they were like a cat and I was a mouse in my own hometown. He moved to Niger for three years and focused his ministry on the Tuareg tribe. And then, overwhelmed with compassion for his own Somali people, he moved to Garissa, 95 miles from the failed state and terrorist hotbed of Somalia. In Garissa, the threats began again almost immediately. A mob of Muslims came to Abdullahi and Helen's house with gas cans, intending to burn it down. When we received death threats, Helen would say later, we'd pray together and that would give us peace because God said he would be with us. Finally, more than two decades after putting his faith in Christ, three assassins shot him to death as he talked with another pastor in the center of Garissa. Abdullahi's ministry was powerful. Returning to Garissa years later, Helen was surprised to learn that Abdullahi's reputation had spread. She was told that every Somali knows about his witness. His influence is still felt throughout the entire Somali Christian community. We have found Somali Christians that have been inspired by his story all over East Africa and even in Europe and the United States. On this day of the Christian martyr, we celebrate the life and ministry of men and women around the world like Abdullahi. In spite of threats, persecution, and even in the face of death, they do not run away. They joyfully embrace risk and danger to share the good news of Jesus Christ. story we hear the story of other Christians who today face that kind of persecution that kind of threat and we see that and for those outside of the church those that don't understand about following Jesus they see that and say why why would you do that why would you willingly go into a place where you know there's hostility, where you know that someone could kill you, and why would you share Jesus there? Why would you be willing to do that? And that's our question. Why would someone like Abdweli be willing to go against everything? Constant threat, constant physical suffering to share the good news of Jesus. Was it just because... 
He was ignorant to the threat around him? Absolutely not. You heard from the very beginning, as soon as he converted to Christianity, his life was threatened. He was not ignorant. Did he think he could rise above it and that his own strength was so great that he was some kind of modern day superhero that bullets wouldn't hurt him? No. He understood. Was he so dumb that he just didn't know? Didn't care? No. The reason that he was able to continue in the face of so much danger to continue to share about the good news of Jesus Christ is Psalm 23, verse 4. Because take a look. Now some of you, I know you have a, you have a Bible or a Bible app and you have a slightly different translation. The NIV says, even though I walk through the darkest valley, but another way to translate darkest valley, perhaps the translation that you grew up with, is the valley of what? Death, the shadow of death. And let's think about that for a moment. The valley of the shadow of death. What does that mean? That means as you go into that valley, death is in the air. That this valley is a place where you can die. Where the danger is so immense. Where their suffering can be so intense. Where you can lose your life. It is the valley of the shadow of death death. And that is the valley that Christians have been walking through. The valley that Abdweli and people living in places where it is dangerous to be a Christian, they walk through knowingly each and every day. They walk through the valley of death. Why? Why? Well, let's go back and look. There's a very important word in the beginning of verse 4, even though I walk, and what's the next word? Through. Now, if you like to take notes, you might want to circle, highlight, and underline that word. Through. What does through mean? When we think about that word through, does that mean that's where you end? That's where the walk stops? Is that the final destination? No. If you walk through, what does that mean? There is another point. There is a different destination to go. That means you don't stop in the valley. You don't stop in the valley of death. You keep walking. Because this is what the good news of Jesus is all about. This is what it means to have a good shepherd. This is what it means that God sent His Son to die on a cross for each and every one of us. That by His blood, His death on that cross... That the valley of the shadow of death is not your final destination. That is not where your journey will end. No. You will walk through. You will walk through the valley. You will walk through the darkest valley. You will walk through the valley of of death because even if your life is taken that is not your final destination as followers of Jesus by the blood of Jesus we are given the promise that death will never be our final destination that on the other side of the valley is heaven is our savior who is waiting for us with open arms saying welcome welcome you know I loved that moment of running from the barn opening the door and closing the door the moment that door closed oh, I could breathe and yes there were many times I would forget to take off my rubber boots with cow manure before I got in that door and so there'd be consequences later but the moment that door closed, I felt peace. Friends, that's nothing compared to the final destination that we have as followers of Jesus. 
the peace and comfort and joy that we will experience on the other side of the valley. He is there. That's why people like Abdweli are willing to walk, willing to go into the valley of death because they know that death is not the end. They will walk through it. Through. Through. That is our hope. That is our good news. And that is only possible because of Jesus Christ. Our good shepherd makes it possible for us to walk through. So as we close today, I want you right now to just close your eyes and picture your dark valley. What is the dark valley that you are going through this morning? What is the dark valley that you have been through? What is it that is just so heavy on your shoulders and on your heart this morning? Is it the uncertainty of things to come? Is it the uncertainty, perhaps for not yourself, but for people in your life, your kids, your grandkids, siblings, your parents? What is that uncertainty that's just hanging in that valley that you are in this morning? Or maybe it's not a valley that you're in right now, but it's a valley that you know is coming up. You know that there are things coming up that you cannot control. There are things coming up that you just... You just don't know how you're going to get through it. I want you just to picture that now with your eyes closed. Just picture that. What is it that is your dark valley this morning? What is it that's painful, that's just pulling on you? What is it that feels like an obstacle in your life that you can just not get around? What is that heaviness on you, that weariness? Perhaps no one else knows but you and God. What is your dark valley this morning? And as you picture that valley, just picture just the overwhelming nature of it. The uncertainty that you have no control over that dark valley. Yes, we like to think as Americans we have control of everything that we can just make plans and that's how it's going to happen. But you and I know that this world is so out of control sometimes. And things can happen in a blink of an eye. And what is it this morning that's just so heavy on you? And as you picture that, Take a breath, open your eyes, and see that cross. See your good shepherd standing there with his staff and his rod. See him standing before you. See him saying, I am willing to guide you, and I will be with you. Because the word of our good shepherd is, We will walk through this valley together. With my shepherd, we will get through whatever valley is in front of us. With my shepherd, we will get through. So go ahead and open your eyes now. I want you to focus on the shepherd. Focus on the shepherd. When you think of financial valleys, of how you're going to make it, of do I have enough for this or that? Do I have enough to pay for this treatment, to pay for this next stage of life, to pay for what my kids need, to pay for what's going on? Remember, we will get through. With my shepherd, we will get through it. With my shepherd, we will get through it. Say it with me. With my shepherd, we will get through it. When you think about relational problems, conflicts that you might be having with people, maybe your own family members, what are we going to say? With my shepherd, we will get through it. When you're thinking about the uncertainty of the next days, of the next weeks, of the next months or years, what are we going to say? With my shepherd, we will get through it. When you think about anything that's just a dark valley of your life, we are going to proclaim, we are going to trust, we are going to put our hope in that shepherd 
and we will proclaim to whatever darkness is in our valley, we will proclaim it with all our might, not because we are strong, but because we have a shepherd who can do all things. We have a shepherd who beat death itself on that cross. We have a shepherd who hit Satan with a rod so big, so hard, that he's still feeling the hurt. That's how we can proclaim it. With my shepherd, we will get through it. Yeah, we're sheep. We are sheep. Sheep get lost. Sheep wander off. Sheep can feel afraid. Sheep are pretty dumb. But even the sheep knows you're never alone. The sheep knows the good shepherd is with me. The shepherd will protect me and will guide me. The valley of darkness, the valley of death is not my final destination. I have a shepherd who's with me, who loves me, and we will get through. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for your son, Jesus. We thank you that we have a good shepherd who gave his life for his flock. That we have a good shepherd who will never give up. We have a good shepherd who says, keep walking. I got you. I'm with you. I will be there. And we know, Lord, that no matter what happens, we will get through it because of you. That you are with us. That you love us. This morning, if there's someone who's just struggling... Lord, help them to hear this and live this. Help them to feel your Holy Spirit right now. Just go ahead and work in their hearts and let them know that with our Good Shepherd, we will get through it. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for our Good Shepherd. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.